Sure, that's great. Hi, everyone. Uh, before we get started, I want to invite folks to move in a little bit. We had to switch rooms because to accommodate the live stream, but um, but you know to to take advantage of the fact that we have a smaller crowd, it would be great if you want to uh, come in a little bit. There are a bunch of seats down here too. I don't bite. Yeah, yeah. neither of us bite. It's more entertaining if you're closer. <laughs> in the middle, I smash it. It's more like a conversation. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Shobita Parthasarathy. I'm professor and director of the Science, Technology, and Public Policy program here at the Ford School of Public Policy. STPP, as it's known, is an interdisciplinary, university-wide program designed to training students, dedicated to training students, conducting cutting-edge research, and informing the public and policymakers on issues at the intersection of technology, science, ethics, society, and public policy. We have a very vibrant graduate certificate program and an exciting lecture series. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to let you know that next term, our speakers will explore the themes of health activism, prescription drug patents and pricing, and graduate STEM education. Our first talk on January 22nd at 4 p.m. is by Lane Scherer, a Ford School alum, who is now at the National Academies of Science, Eng Engineering, and Medicine, and she'll be talking about graduate STEM education in the 21st century. If you're interested in learning more about our events, I encourage you to sign up uh, for our listserv that is just the mailing, the sign-up sheet is just outside the auditorium, but even if you haven't had a chance uh, to, if you are already on our listserv, please do sign up there as well, because it gives us a sense of, of who's been able to come today. Today's talk, Show Your Face, the Pros and Cons of Facial Recognition Technology for Our Civil Liberties, is co-sponsored by the Center for Ethics, Society, and Computing and the Science and Technology Policy Student Group, Inspire, as part of their themed semester on just algorithms. Inspire is a Rackham interdisciplinary working group run by STPP students, but it is open to all graduate students around the university who are interested in science and technology policy. And now to today's speaker. Mr. Christopher Calabrese is the Vice President for Policy at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Before joining CDT, he served as Legislative Counsel at the American Civil Liberties Union's, American Civil Liberties Union's Washington Legislative Office. Don't try to say that 10 times fast. In that role, he led the office's advocacy efforts related to privacy, new technology, and identification systems. His key areas of focus included limiting location tracking by police, safeguarding electronic communications and individual users' internet surfing habits, and regulating new surveillance technologies such as an unmanned drones. Mr. Calabrese has been a longtime advocate for privacy protections, limits on government surveillance, advocating for the responsible use of new and developing technologies such as facial recognition. This afternoon, he'll speak for about 15 minutes, giving us a lay of the land, and then he and I will chat for about 15 minutes or so, and then we will open the floor for questions. Please submit your questions on the index cards that are being distributed now, and that will be distributed throughout the talk. Sujin Kim, our student assistant at STPP, will circulate throughout the room to collect them. And if you're watching on our live stream, you can ask questions via the hashtag STPPTalks. 
Claire Galligan, our wonderful Ford School undergraduate research assistant, and Dr. Molly Kleinman, STPP's program manager, will then collate and ask the questions. I want to take the opportunity to thank all of them, and especially Molly and Sujin, for their hard work in putting this event together. And now, please join me in welcoming Mr. Calabrese. Thank you. Uh, thanks, all, thanks to all of you for coming. Um, this is obviously a topic that I care a great deal about, so it's really exciting to me to see so many people who are equally interested. Uh, thanks to Shobita for having me, and thank you to the Ford School for hosting. Um, I, I think these are really important topics. Uh, as we incorporate more and more technology into our lives, we need to spend more time thinking about the impact of that technology and, uh, and what we want to do with it. And face recognition is a really great example. It's powerful, it's useful, and it's often dangerous. Like many technologies, this is, this is a technology that can do so many things. It can find a wanted fugitive from surveillance footage. It can identify everybody at a protest rally. It can find a missing child from social media posts. It can allow a potential stalker to identify an unknown woman on the street. This is really a technology that w w has the potential to and is already impacting a wide swath of our society. That's why it's gotten so much attention. We saw a ban on face recognition technology in San Francisco. We've seen a number of lawmakers really engaged. And we, you know, we as a society really need to grapple with what we want to do with it. So before I get too deep into this, just a word about definitions. I'm going to talk about something fairly specific. I'm going to talk about face recognition, which is taking a, some, a measurement of someone's face, so the, how far apart are their eyes, how high or low are their ears, the shape of their mouth, and using that to create an individual template that is essentially a number that can be used to go back to another photo of that same person and do that same type of measurement and see if there's a match. So it's literally a tool for identifying someone. It can be a tool for identifying the same person. So if I bring my passport to the passport authority, they can say, is the, the person on the passport photo the person standing in front of me? Or it can be used as a tool for identifying someone from a crowd. So I can pick one of you and see and, you know, do a face recognition match and see if I can identify particular people in this room based off of a database of photos that the face recognition system is going to run against. That's face recognition, and that's what we're going to talk about. There are a few other things I won't talk about. One of them is something called face identification, and that's literally like, is there a person standing in front of me? We might use that to count the number of people in a crowd. We might use that to you know, decide if we're going to show a digital signage at a billboard. That, but we're, but, and that's usually less problematic. There's another type of technology I won't talk about called face analysis. Face analysis is literally looking at someone's face and trying to make a determination about them. Are they lying? Are they you know, going to be a good employee? This technology doesn't work. It's, it's <laughs> basically snake oil, which is part of the reason I won't talk about it. But you will see people trying to sell this concept that we can essentially take pictures of people and, um, and learn a lot about them. But I can tell you that face recognition does work. And it's something that we're seeing increasingly deployed in a wide variety of contexts. Um, so I already talked a little bit about what, what exactly face recognition is, this sort of measurement of people's faces, turning that measurement into a a, disc a discrete number that I can store in a database and then compare against other photos, take that, see if I get that same measurement, and then see if I've identified the person. Um, there's a couple of things that you need to understand if you want to think about this technology and how it actually works and whether it's going to work. The first is a concept we call binning. So binning is literally putting people in bins, putting them in groups. And so it turns out, and this is pretty intuitive, that if I want to identify someone, it's much easier if I, if I know they're one of 100 people in a photograph, one of 100 people in a group versus one in a million. It's just a much simpler exercise, right? So, you can, so that's one thing to keep in mind as you hear about face recognition, is to think not just about the technology that's taking that measurement of your face, 
but the technology that's being used to pull the database in from outside. And the, the size of that database is hugely important for the types of errors we can see, how accurate the system is. Uh, so a little bit of history for you. So face recognition has been used for a long time, even though it really has only started to be effective in the last couple of years. If you go all the way back to 2001, before 9-11, police tried out face recognition at the Super Bowl in Tampa. And they actually did a face recognition survey of all the people who entered the Super Bowl. And it didn't work. The technology wasn't ready for prime time. It couldn't identify people. It was swamped by the, the number of different faces and the different angles that those faces were taken at. And so for a long time, that was the beginning in the and the end of the conversation as far as I was concerned. Because if a technology doesn't work, why should we use it? But you know, as I was saying to someone, I had a friend who works in the industry, and he, we had lunch a couple of years ago. And he said to me, it works now. It's this, this technology will actually match and identify people. And that was a kind of a Rubicon, and we've seen that in the last couple of years. The, the NIST, which is the National Institute for Science and Technology, which does standard setting for the federal government, has confirmed that. They've said that in the, you know, earlier this year, they said massive gains in accuracy have been achieved in the last five years, and these far exceed improvements made in the prior period, which is the prior five years. So we're seeing this technology being used more and more it's more and more accurate. Um, and, and we can really understand why that is. Um, we have more powerful computers. We have better AI that does this type of comparison. Um, we also have better photo databases. I mean, if you look at the LinkedIn photo database, if you looked at the Facebook photo database, these are high resolution photos, often many different kinds of photos to give you many different kinds of templates, all linked to someone's real identity. That's a perfect tool for creating a face recognition database. So why, why do we care? Like, what's the big deal about face recognition? Um, and there's a couple of things that I think as advocates and, and I hope that we care about and I hope I can convince you to care about a little bit too. Um, the first thing is that we have sort of all kinds of assumptions that we make about our privacy that are grounded in technical realities. So we assume that while we might go out in public and somebody might see us, and if they happen to know us, they might identify us. That's, that's where you get this idea that, well, you don't have privacy in public, right? You put yourself out there. But the reality is that when you're out in public, you don't necessarily expect to be identified, especially by a stranger. You don't expect to be potentially tracked across a series of cameras, and you don't expect that record to be kept indefinitely. That's a different type of use of the technology, and it really sort of changes our assumptions about what privacy looks like and what privacy looks like in public. Um, and of course, you can imagine the impact on that for if you're taking doing photo recognition on, for example, a protest rally. You can see how suddenly I have knowledge of who may be worried about the border, and that allows me to, to take other kinds of punitive action. The, and, and of course, it also allows me to figure out who your friends are, who are you walking with, those kind of associational pieces of information that we worry about. Um, it also changes the rules in other ways that we don't always think about, that, but I would encourage you to. So we, we jaywalk every day. We cross the street when we're not supposed to. You are breaking the law when you jaywalk. Everybody does it. But what if we could enforce jaywalking 100% of the time? What if I could do a face search, identify you, and send you a ticket every time you jaywalk? That would fundamentally change how the law was enforced. It wouldn't change how you interacted with society. We could do it, whether we would do it or not, or whether we should do it as a separate rule, but these are laws around the books that could be enforced using this technology. And so, and so that's a concern. And the second concern I think that's related is if we don't enforce it against anybody and we start to enforce it in a selective way, what kind of bias does that introduce into the system? And you can just sort of think about that for a minute. Um, on, in, the, in the private sector, we also see a lot of changing in, in relationships. And that's, you know, I already raised the stalker example, but there is off-the-shelf technology sold by a variety of companies. Amazon recognition is, is one of the most well-known that you can purchase and you can use to run your own set of data, databases. And we've already noted that there's a lot of public databases of photos and identification. You can take those, run those databases 
against your own off-the-shelf face recognition software and identify people. And so there's a, you know, suddenly that stalker can identify you. Suddenly those marketer can, that marketer can identify you. Suddenly that photo, that embarrassing photo of you from 2005 that is sort of still exists on the web but nobody sees and it's not captioned and don't, does, nobody knows it's you, well suddenly you can be identified. And if you're in a compromising position or you're, you know, you were drunk, I mean, there's a lot of photos out there about all of us. Potentially that's revealed information that can embarrass you. The, the next sort of, the other reason we might worry about this is that mistakes happen. This is a technology that's not, it's far from, from perfect and in fact has a great deal of racial bias in it. Because many, as you, when you create a face recognition template, we, we, don't, we, won't, we can get into this maybe in the Q&A, but you're using, essentially you are training the system to recognize faces. So if you only put the faces in the system that you get from Silicon Valley, you may end up with a lot of white faces, a lot of faces that are not representative of the broader population. And as a result, your face recognition algorithm isn't going to do as good a job of, of, of recognizing non-white faces. And literally, the error rate will be higher. And so these are, these, this is sort of a bias problem, but it's also, there's also just a broader mistake problem. As the technology gets used more broadly, people will rely on it, and they will be less likely to believe that in fact the machine made a mistake. People tend to, to trust the technology and that, and that can be problematic. Ultimately, I would just sort of give you this construct just to sort of sit with this idea of social control. The more that someone knows about you, the more they can affect your decisions. If they know where, if they know that you went to an abortion clinic, if they know you went to a gun show, if they know you went to, a, to church, None of those things are illegal in, uh, you know, in and amongst themselves, but someone, especially if it's the government taking this action, may make decisions about you. I'll give you an example that's not face recognition related, but is, I think, instructive. So when I was at the ACLU, we had a series of clients who protested at the, uh, at the border in San Diego. The, San Di the border wall runs right through San Diego. And so they all parked their cars at, at the border and they went and they had this protest. And then, you know, they, as they came out of the protest, they found people that they didn't recognize writing down their license plate. And, those, and they didn't know who that was. But then many of those people found themselves on being harassed when they were crossing the border. They were, you know, these are unsurprisingly people who went back and forth a lot. And they found themselves being more likely to be pulled into secondary screening, face more intrusive questions. And they believed, and it, this was something we were never able to prove, but I, I feel very confident, was because of this type of data collection, because they were identified as, as, as people who deserve further scrutiny. That's what happens as you deploy these technologies. You create potential information that can be used to affect your rights in a variety of ways. And, and face recognition is a, a really powerful way to do that. So what should we do? What, what should we do about this? Um, you know, there are some people who say we should ban this technology. Face recognition has no place in our society. Well, it's, that's a fair argument. I, I think it does discount the potential benefits of face recognition. I, I was at Heathrow Airport, um, I don't, or maybe it was Gatwick, I think. But I was, at, I was in London, and it was, I was jet lagged. It was red eye. It was like 6 a.m. I kind of walked up, and I looked at them at you know the the sort of ran through the checkpoint and then I looked up at this at this literally just went like this and then I kept walking and I realized had you know 30 seconds later I had just cleared customs that was face recognition and it sort of completely eliminated the need for them to do a customs check now maybe maybe it's not worth it but that's that's a real benefit right if you've ever stood in one of those lines you're saying well, gosh that sounds great and that's a relatively trivial example compared to somebody who, say, has lost a child and, but thinks that you know, maybe that child has been abducted by someone they know, which is unfortunately frequently the case. You can imagine, remember going back to that binning, you can imagine that maybe there's a photo that might help somewhere in your social network. 
If you could do face recognition on the people in your social network, you might find that child. These are real benefits. So we have to think about what we want to do when we, whenever we talk about banning a technology. So the close cousin of the ban, and this is one that I think is, is maybe more effective or useful in this context, is the moratorium. And that's this idea that we should flip the presumption. You should not be able to use face recognition unless you, there are rules around it and rules that govern it. So, and that's, that's a really effective idea because it forces the people who want to use it to explain what they're going to use it for, what controls are going to be in place, why they should be allowed the authorization to use this powerful technology. So if we did have a moratorium, or even if we didn't, and we just wanted to regulate the technology, what would this regulation look like? And by the way, this regulation could happen at the federal level, and it could happen at the state level. There's already at least one state, the state of Illinois, that has very powerful uh, controls on biometrics for commercial use. You cannot collect a biometric record in Illinois without consent. So these are, these are laws that are possible. There's no federal equivalent to that. So as we think about how would we think about this, I think the first thing, especially in the commercial context, is to think about consent. You, if you can say that it's illegal to create a face print of my face for this service without my consent, that gives me the power back on that technology. Right? I'm the one who decides whether I'm part of a face recognition system and what it looks like. And you know, that's a hard, that can be a hard line to draw because it's so easy to create this kind of face template from a photo without your permission. But it's a start, and it allows you to, you know, responsible people who deploy face recognition technology will deploy it you know, and require consent. Um, and then after consent is obtained, you probably you want transparency. You want people to know when face re recognition is being able to be used. <clears throat> so that's, that's the broad idea. And we can talk a lot more about this in the Q&A, but from the consent side, from the private side. Government side is a little bit more tricky. Uh, I think from a government point of view, government is going to do things sometimes without your consent. That's a, that's a fundamental reality for law enforcement, for example. So what, do we, so what do we do? And I think in the government context, we fall back on some time-honored traditions that we find in the US Constitution. And that's the concept of probable cause. So probable cause is this idea that, and this is embedded in the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, this idea that it is more, we should be able, government should be able to search for something if it is more likely than not that they will find evidence that, of a crime. And in order to get that probable cause, they frequently have to go to a judge and say, hey, I have evidence to believe that this, going into this person's house will, I'll uncover drugs because, and here's all the evidence that they were a drug dealer, and then I can search their house. We can deploy a similar, the same idea with face recognition. We could say that you, need, you can only search for somebody. Remember I said there's that wanted fugitive who's, who I, I think I can go look at surveillance camera footage and maybe find him. You need, maybe need to go to a judge and say, Your Honor, we have probable cause to say that this person has committed the crime. They're likely to be somewhere in this series of you know, footage. And, you know, we would like to, we, you know, we believe we can arrest him if we, if we find him. The judge can sign off on that, you know, vet that evidence, and then the, the, the technology can be deployed. Uh, similarly, there's a, you know, there are exigent circumstances, and we have this in the law right now. So if I think that there is an emergency, say I have, you know, a situation where someone has been abducted, I believe they're still on the, for example, the London Metro, which is blanketed with surveillance cameras. And I believe that that child's life is in danger. There's a concept in the law called exigency, which is this idea that there's an emergency. I can prove there's an emergency. I need to deploy the technology. And we can build those kind of concepts into the law. So I'm going into a lot of detail on this, mostly because I think it's worth understanding that these are not, bi these are not binary choices. It is not flip on face recognition. We're all identified all the time. I'm sure many of you are old enough to remember Minority Report, the movie which used a lot of biometric scanning throughout the, and it was sort of this, everybody just was, bi was scanned and there was face recognition happening all the time and advertisements were being shown to them constantly. We don't have to live in that world. 
But we also don't have to say that we're never going to get any of the benefit of this technology, and we're not going to see, see it used for all kinds of purposes that may, in fact, make our lives more convenient or more safe. So with that sort of brief overview, I will stop, and uh, Shabita, we can chat, and then take some questions and go from there. So I, um, I'm very, I've been thinking about this issue a lot, and I'm very interested in it, and I, I think I tend to agree with you in lots of ways, but I'm going to try my best sure. to occasionally at least play uh, devil's advocate. Uh, as my students know, I try to do that, although sometimes <laughs> I'm more successful that, than others. But maybe first, I'd be interested in, in your talking a little bit more about the accuracy issue. So. Yeah. You said it's evolved over time. It's more mm. accurate than it used to be. Now NIST says it's accurate. Um, first of all, you know, what does that mean? Um, right. And how is NIST determining that? Uh, and um, yeah, why don't we start there? Sure, that's a great, it's a wonderful place to start. So, um, so accuracy varies widely depending on how you're deploying the technology. It, it depends, so just to give, to give an example, so if I, am walking up in a well-lit customs office, even if I, it's not a one-to-one -one match where I'm, somebody's already holding it, if it's a well-lit situation, I'm looking right at the camera, that you're much more likely to get a good face print and one that's accurate, especially if you have a database that's backing up that image or that's backing up that search that may have like three or four or five or six images of, of me from different angles. Like that's a, that's a very optimum sort of environment to do a face print. And you're going to much more likely to get an accurate identification, especially as if I mentioned before, you have a relatively narrow pool of people that you're, you're doing the search against. The reverse is true, obviously. If you have a side photo of somebody that you only have a couple of photos of and the photo quality may not be particularly good, you can see how the accuracy is going to sort of, sort of pin, uh, go up and down, depending on what, what the environment is. And so, you know, part of the, the trick here, part of the thing we have to expect from policymakers is to vet these kind of deployments. Like, how are you using it? What's your expectation once you find a match? How accurate are you going to treat it? What's going to be your procedure for independently verifying that this person you just essentially identified as a perpetrator of a crime actually committed that crime? It can't just be the beginning and the end of it as a face recognition. And so in terms of what, what NIST does, they do sort of exactly what you would expect they would do, right? They have their own photo sets. They will have, they will take the variety of algorithms that exist and that you can, they will run those algorithms against their own data sets and just see how good a job they do, see how accurate they are in these variety of different contexts. And this, I think it, it bears putting a fine point mm -hmm. on. The accuracy doesn't just differ depending on whether you're straight on or on right. the side, right? One of the big issues with accuracy is that it's different right. for, it's most accurate among white men, yep. and then it degrades in accuracy, that's, right? And thank you, uh, I, and I should, have, I should have made, should have said that first, because that's really the most important thing. We are seeing a lot of racial disparity, um, because of, most, mostly because of the training set data, but I'm not, I don't know if we know actually enough yet to know if it's 100% the training set data or not. Um, or it's that, you know, there may be other questions, other areas of machine learning that are also impacting it. But we are seeing a tremendous variation. Um, it's problematic not just because it's, um, not just because of the identification issues, but because, uh, Robert, you and I were talking about this the other, the earlier today. I mean, if you're not identified as a person at all, right, because the, the system does not recognize you, that has all kinds of other potential negative consequences for automated systems. So it's a, it's a very big deal. It's also worth saying that it's, it doesn't, you know, I, I worry a little bit that people are going to say, well, once we fix that accuracy problem, that then it's okay. And I hope I've sort of convinced you at least a little bit that we're not, the problem doesn't end even if the system isn't racially biased. That's sort of the minimum level that we need to get over before we can even begin to talk about how we might deploy it. So sort of linking to that, and maybe, you know, you um, mentioned a few of these uh, cases of potentially, I'll put it in my language, and, um, you know, sort of new forms of social control or mm -hmm. reinforcing uh, existing forms of social control. I think 
Um, some of you in the audience may have heard about this, but it, I think it bears mentioning in this context, uh, which is that now about a month ago, uh, news broke that a contractor working for Google, you probably know who it was, um, was caught uh, trying to improve the accuracy of their facial recognition algorithm for the Pixel 4 phone by um, going to Atlanta, uh, uh, where there's, of course, a large African-American population, and uh, asking men, homeless African-American men, to play with a phone uh, and uh, to play a selfie game. So they were not right. consented, uh, but their faces were scanned, right? Uh, and so that keeps ringing in my head whenever I'm thinking about this stuff. And I think what's interesting to me about it, and I wanted to get your sense of this, what's interesting to me about this, and it ties to what you were talking about in terms of social control, is that, that what, what the act of supposedly increasing the accuracy supposedly to serve um, at least argument, uh, arguably the, the additional, you know, to serve African-American populations actually ultimately serves to reinforce existing power dynamics and uh, the, you know, discrimination that uh, African-Americans have historically uh, experienced. And so I'm wondering, you know, in the, in, in the sort of, um, in pursuit of this goal of accuracy, in the pursuit of, you know, this wonderful technology that's going to save our lives, you know, these kinds of things are, are happening too. Well, I mean, that is the, the, the funny thing about rights. I mean, it's everybody that needs, their, needs to have their rights respected. Everybody deserves equal rights. But the reality is that those are the kind of communities who really need to have their rights respected. They really need something like a consent framework because they're the kind of people who are most likely to have images because they have less power. They have less ability to say, I am not going to consent to this or maybe less knowledge of how the... So they're really, when we're creating these rights, part of what we're doing is building on existing power structures and, and power imbalances where I may have more power and, 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 and you may have less. And hence, it's even more important that I have this ability to, to actually exercise my rights and, and know what they are. And another piece of this, which I didn't mention in my talk, but is there's a, a number of already unfair systems that face recognition might be built on top of. The most use, the, I think one of the, the most illustrative examples is the terrorist watch list. So there is a list in the United States, main, uh, ever-changing list, maintained by a, a part of the FBI that where you, are, you can be identified as a, as a potential terrorist. There's a master list that then feeds into a wide variety of different parts of the federal government. It affects things like whether you get secondary screening at the airport, and in rare cases, even whether you're allowed to fly at all. So. And there's, this is a, a secret list. You, you don't know when you're on it. It's hard to know how to get off it. And the incentives are very bad because if I'm an FBI agent and I'm sort of on the fence about whether to put you in a database, I can tell you if I put you in the database and nothing happens, no harm, no foul. If I don't put you in the database and you do something bad, my, my career is over. So there's a lot of incentive to put people in lists. Well, you can imagine putting somebody on a list and combining that with the power of face recognition creates an even greater imbalance because now I've got a secret list and I've got a way to track you across society. So that's an existing unfairness that has nothing to do with face recognition, but face recognition can exacerbate. So how would a consent framework work in that context given that there are already um, places, I mean in this context right. where there's information, but also you know, we're in a society now where our faces are being captured all the time. So right. how would you envision? So what you would consent to in a very technical way, you would consent to, the, to turning your face into a face print. You would consent to creating that piece of personal information about you, literally the way your social security number is a number about you. This would be a number that encapsulates what your face looks like. That would be the point at which you would have to consent. And I think we might have to do some stuff around exist a lot of existing face recognition databases, either saying those databases need to be re-upped or, you know, but the reality is that we, if you can catch it there, then at least you're saying, you're taking the good actors and you're saying it's not okay to take somebody's face print without their permission. And that, and then again, as we said, the government's a little different and of course it's not, these are not magic, this is not a magic wand, right? Fixing 
the problems with face recognition doesn't fix all the other problems with society and how we use these technologies. Um, so you mentioned the you know going through going through customs or going yeah. through European immigration and and the ease of facial recognition um, uh, there and and that sort of con the excitement of convenience yeah. right and and I'm wondering um, and you said maybe that's a, a that's an acceptable use of it um, and I guess when you said that I was like well I'm not sure if it's an acceptable use of it because uh, I worry a little bit about mm -hmm. the fact that that normalizes the technology that then. Um, people start wondering why it's a problem in other domains. Look, it worked when I went through immigration. Why would there be a problem for us to use it for, um, you know, crime fighting or, or um, you know, to education schools or hiring or, you know, sort of. Yeah. You know, it's, it's always a balance. I mean, I, when I'm considering some of these new technologies, I tend to think about people's real world expectations. And I think in the context of a border stop. You expect to be identified. You expect that a photo is going to be looked at and that somebody is going to make sure that Chris Calabrese was Chris Calabrese. So that to me feels like a comfortable use of the technology because it's not, it's not really invading anybody's, you know, the idea of what, what task is, is going to be performed. So for a while, and they don't do it this way anymore, but a less intuitive example of this, but one that I thought was okay, and it was, this is a little bit controversial, was that Facebook would do a face template, and that, that's how they recommend friends to you. They like, you know, when you get a tagged photo and they say, is this Chris Calabrese, your friend? And you can, t that's face recognition. For a long time, they would only recommend people if you were already friends with them. So the assumption was that you would be able to recognize your friends in real life, so it was okay to tag them and recommend them. Now, that's a little bit controversial. It's definitely not. You're not getting explicit consent to do that, but maybe it feels okay because it doesn't feel like it violates a norm you expect to identify your friends. They now do it, they now have a consent-based framework where you have to, you do have to opt in, but for a while they had sort of that hybrid approach. So I think it's helpful to map in, in the real world. Um, I do think that you, you have issues where you're potentially normalizing it, and I, another area I didn't bring up, but one is one that's, I think, going to be kind of controversial is face identification and employment. Um, you know, obviously we know that the consent in an employment context is a kind of a fraught concept. Often you consent because you want to have a job. Um, but, you know, you really do have a potential there to have that technology, you know, well, don't, we're not going to do the punch cards anymore. We're just going to, you know, do a face recognition scan to, to, to check you in. But then, of course, that same face recognition technology could be used to make sure that you are cleaning hotel rooms at fast enough, right? Make sure that you're, you know, track your movements across your day, see how much time you're spending in the bathroom. Like these technologies can, can quickly escalate, especially in an employment context, which can be pretty coercive. So yes, there's a lot to this idea that we want to set norms for how we use the technology because the creep can happen pretty fast and be pretty, you know, violative of your privacy and your rights. Um, so I've been asking questions that are pretty critical, but I, but I feel like I should ask the question that my mother would probably ask. Uh, so my mother would say I live a very yep. pure, good uh, life. I'm, I live on the straight and narrow. You know, if I'm not guilty of anything, mm -hmm. if I'm not doing anything strange, if I'm not protesting at the border, why right. should I be worried about this technology or why should I care? What... Um, you know, it's fine, and it actually protects me from kidnapping and other things, and I'm getting older, and, sure. um, you know, this is a great public safety technology. Yes, the old, if I did done nothing wrong, you, right. you know, what do you have to hide? So, I mean, I think the obvious first answer is just the mistake answer, right? Just because you're, just because it isn't you doesn't mean that somebody may not think it's you and that technology may be deployed, and especially if you're, you know, part of a population that may not actually you know, the system may not work as well on. So that's, that's one piece of it. Um, I also think that you don't always, you know, who are you hiding from, right? Maybe you're, you're comfortable with the government, but are you really comfortable with like the creepy guy down the street who can now figure out who you are and, and maybe from there, like where you live? That's, a, you know, that's, a, that's legal in the United States right now. And it seems like the kind of technology use that we would we really worry about. 
um, you know, activists, and, and I think this isn't something I, you know, this isn't something CDT did, but there were activists for um, Fight for the Future. They, they put on big white decontamination suits and they taped a camera to their forehead and they just stood in the halls of Congress and took face recognition scans all day. And they, they actually identified a member of Congress. They were looking for lobbyists for Amazon because they were using Amazon face recognition technology. It's a, it was an interesting illustration of this idea of like, you are giving a lot of power to strangers to know who you are and then potentially use that for all kinds of things that you don't have control over. So we take for granted, I think, a lot of our functional anonymity in this country. And the reality is that face recognition, if unchecked, will do a really good job of stripping away a lot of that functional anonymity. And some people are always going to say it's fine. But I think at least what I would say to them is, you don't have to lose the benefit of this technology in order to still have some rights to control how it's used. There are ways that we have done this in the past and gotten the benefit of these technologies without all of these harms. So why are you so quick to just give up and let somebody use these technologies in harmful ways when you don't have to? So how would you, you I, I think in our earlier conversation this morning you may have mentioned this briefly, but I'm wondering when you think about governance frameworks, mm -hmm how you think about the, what the criteria might be to decide what's a problematic technology and what is not. Is that the way to think about it or is it, um, are there other criteria? What kinds of experts, who should be making these kinds of decisions? Um, is there a role, for example, for academic work uh, or research more generally in terms of assessing the ethical social dimensions and in what, um, on, on, on what parameters, I guess? So it's a, it's a great question. So I, I think I would say we would kind of, we would want to start with having a process for um, getting public input into how we're deploying these technologies. The ACLU is, and CDT has, has helped with this a little bit, has been running a pretty effective campaign of trying to essentially get cities and towns to pass laws that say, anytime you're going to deploy a new surveillance technology, you have to bring it before the city council. It has to get vetted. We have to understand how it's going to be used so we can make decisions about whether this is the right technology. So just creating just a trigger mechanism where we're going to have a conversation first. Because it may sound strange to say this, but that actually doesn't happen all that often. Oftentimes what happens is a local police department gets a grant from the Department of Justice or, or DHS, and they use that grant to buy a drone, and then they get that drone, and then they might get trained by DHS, but you know, may not, and then they fly that drone. And they haven't appropriated any money from the city, they haven't put that in front of the city council, they just start to use it. And then it comes out, and sometimes city council is, is really upset, or sometimes the police draw it back, and sometimes they don't. But just having that public conversation is a really useful sort of mechanism for controlling some of that technology. So I would say that's a beginning, obviously, you know, state lawmakers can play a really important role. Federal lawmakers should be playing a role, but we're not passing as many laws in, in D.C. as, you know, or we are, we're not doing quite as much governing in D.C. as maybe we, people would like. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty, without being too pejorative, I mean, we are, we are at a little bit of a loggerheads in terms of partisanship, and that makes it hard to pass things federally. But that does, there's a lot of other, you know, that's the wonder of the federalist system is that there's lots of other places you can go. Um, Academic researchers are tremendously important because, I mean, I said, I think at the top, like for a long time, my answer to many of these technologies is this one specifically was, it doesn't work. So if it doesn't work, and if an academic can say, this technology doesn't work, or these are the limits, that's a tremendously powerful piece of information. But it's really hard for your ordinary citizen to separate out the snake oil from truly powerful and innovative new technologies. And I think technologists and academics play a really important role in just as a vetting mechanism and saying, you know, yes or no to a policymaker who wants to know, well, like, is, it, is what they're saying true? It, that kind of neutral third party is really important. So I don't know how much you, you know about this, but facial recognition has been particularly controversial in Michigan. Oh, interesting. Um, so for two years, over two years, Detroit um, ha was using facial recognition, uh, something called Project Greenlight, mm -hmm. uh, without any of the kinds of transparency that you're 
that you're rec mm. recommending and you're talking about. Uh, it came to light with the help of, of um, activists. And so now the city, you know, they've sort of said, okay, fine. I mean, and it was sort of being used indiscriminately as far mm. as we can tell. Um, and, and more recently, the mayor came out and said, okay, we, we promise we'll only use it you know, in very na for very narrow mm -hmm. um, uh, criminal justice uses. But of course, again, Detroit, a majority African-American city, one in which there is not um, a great trust between right. the citizens and the, and the government, um, you know, that kind of falls on, on um, deaf ears. So, and one of the things that, even though they're now using it, my sense is that um, one of the things that's missing is transparency in understanding how the technology, where's the data coming from, how is the technology used, um, what kinds of algorithms, there's no independent assessment of any of this. Right. Um, so I'm wondering if you know anything about this or if you have recommendations on how, you know, in those kinds of settings, how you might um, try to influence that kind of um, decision make because often these are proprietary algorithms that these right. police departments are buying and they're not even asking the right questions necessarily right so yeah, they're not and I think um, so it's a it's a really compelling case study because you're right the reality is it's gosh it's really hard to trust a system that hasn't bothered to be transparent or truthful with us for years gets caught and this is oh I'm sorry and then kind of yeah, we'll, we'll put some protections in place. So that, that's not an environment for building trust in a technology. It doesn't say, you know, citizens and government are partners in trying to do, do this right. It says, what can we get away with? Um, so yes, so it, to, in no particular order, clearly there should be transparency about what, who the vendor is, what the accuracy ratings for those products are. Without, relieve, without revealing anything proprietary, you should be able to answer the question of how accurate your algorithm is in a variety of tests. You know, NIST has a series of, they test these products and they'll tell you, they go like, you know, just Google NIST face recognition tests and you can read the 100 page report that, lay, that evaluates all the algorithms. This isn't secret stuff. Um, you should know when it's being deployed. Like you should have, you should have, be able to understand um, how often a search is run, what was the factual predicate that led to that search, um, what was the result of that search, did it identify someone, was that identification accurate? I mean, these are kind of fundamental questions that don't reveal secret information, they just are sort of necessary transparency, and we see them in lots of other contexts. If you, if you do an emergency, um, if you're a law enforcement officer, if you're a Department of Justice, and you want to get access and read somebody's email in, a, in an emergency context, right? You say, it's an emergency, I can't wait to get that warrant, I, you know, I have to get this. You have to file a report. It's, I, for, it's, uh, well, I won't bore you with the code section, but it's, it's just a legal requirement. I have to report why, why, why this is and what's the basis for it. So these kind of like basic transparency mechanisms are things that we have in other technologies and we kind of have to reinvent every time we have a new technology. Like the, the problems do not change. The, many of the same concerns exist. It's just that the technology is often written, or excuse me, the law is often written for a particular technology. And so when we have a new technology, we have to go back and reinvent some of these protections and make sure they're broad enough to cover these new technologies. It's also so in my field we would call this a socio-technical system. I mean, right. one of the things that that you didn't say, but I would also think you would want, but you know, and I'm wondering. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm thinking about other previous technologies sure, and, yeah, and there's the a lot recent. Of things you could, I would add to that. But, yeah, but. no, I was just thinking about there was a recent um, uh, um, article, lengthy article, investigative mm -hmm. um, article in the New York Times about breathalyzers, and in that article they talked about how there's both the calibration of the device um, and ensuring that the device remains appropriately calibrated, but also that there's an interpretation, there's interpretation, there's a lot of, you know, it's a human material system, right? Mm -hmm. And in this case, the there may be a match, right? It's a percentage match. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, you have humans in the system who are doing a lot of the interpretive work who also need to be trained, and we also don't have transparency about that either, do we? No, we don't. And 
And, and that's an incredibly important part of the sort of training of any system is understanding what you're going to do with a potential match when you find it. So I'll give you, I, I use this example, we yeah, talked about it right. earlier. <laughs> but so uh, probably, I don't know if they still do it this way, but this wasn't a lot longer, probably maybe 10 years ago, I went to uh, the big facility in West Virginia that handles all of the FBI's computer systems, right? That the NCTC says, or not the, excuse me, the, uh, the system that when you like get stopped for a traffic violation, the system that they check against your, your driver's license before they get out of the car to make sure that you're not a wanted fugitive and they're not gonna, you know, they, they, it's all fake quartered here. And one of the things that they do in that, head, in that facility is they do all the fingerprint matches. So if I, you know, if I get a criminal, um, you know, if I get a print at a crime scene and I wanna go see if it's matched against the FBI database, this is where I send it. So, you know what happens when they do a fingerprint match, at least 10 years ago, but still this is a technology that's been deployed for 150 years? There's a big room. It's 10 times the size of this room. It's filled with like people sitting at desks with two monitors. And this monitor is a fingerprint. And on this monitor is the five or six match it, potential matches. And a human being goes to see if the whirls of your fingerprint actually match the right print. That, so if you think about it, that's a technology that's 100 years old and we are still having people make sure it's right. If you, so that is the kind of, just to give you sort of the, the air gap between what automation can do and then what the system can do. Imagine now, how are we gonna handle this protocol when I have a photo of my suspect and then I've got six photos of people who look an awful lot like this person. Like how am I gonna decide which is the right one? And it may be the answer is that you can't definitively. You just need to investigate each of those six people and see if they're, and the reality is with face recognition, it's often kicking out not six, but 50. And so there are real limitations to the technology. It is getting better, so I don't want to oversell those limitations, especially if you're, there are other things you're doing, like narrowing the photos you're running against. But there's a, there, is, there are systems that will have to be built on top of the technology itself. To make, to make sure that we're optimizing both the results and the protections. So, you know, we've been at SP, STPP doing a, a research project around this in our new technology assessment clinic. And uh, one of the things that we've been thinking, what we've noticed in our sort of initial analysis of the sort of political economy of this is that it is, of course, a global industry. Yes. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm wondering how, you know, the legal frameworks, what are the legal frameworks that are evolving? Um, what are the global dimensions of its mm -hmm. use? And how are those interfacing with the legal frameworks? And does that have any implications for the way we think about it here in the US? No, it has huge implications. Um, so there's a couple of things to think about globally. Um, I think maybe the first is that most developed westernized countries have a baseline privacy law. So there's a comprehensive baseline privacy law that regulates the sharing and collection of personal information. So if you were in the UK, for example, there would be rules for who could collect your personal information and what they could do with it and getting permission for it. And those rules, I, I believe, you know, by and large, I believe do apply to face recognition. I think there's, there, there may be some nuance there, but we, I think the expectation from the people in those countries is that face recognition will, will be covered and then what the you know, impact of that will be. And so that's, a, that's important because it goes back to that idea that I mentioned before about, you know, do we start with justify why you're going to use the technology or do we start with go ahead and use the technology unless you can prove that there's a reason not to. And I think we want to be more in the don't use the technology unless you have a good reason. But what equally interesting, at least to me, is that this technology is becoming, as it become, diffuses and becomes more global, and there's a number of countries that are really leaders in face recognition technology, Israel is one. Um, you may have a harder time controlling it. If I can go online, go to a, a, a you know an Israeli company, download face recognition software, scrape the LinkedIn database without my, your permission, and create a database of a hundred million people that I can then use for identification purposes, that's really hard to regulate. I, you know, it may be illegal eventually in the United States, but from a regulatory point of view, it's, it's a real 
enforcement nightmare to try to figure out what the when that system how that system was created and how it might be used so this globalization issue is a real problem because a US based company may may not do that but then certainly there are going to be places offshore where you may be able to use that and it may be less of a problem I mean you see there's lots of places that you can illegally torrent content there are lots of people who do that. There are also lots of people who don't because they don't want to do something that's illegal because they don't want to potentially get a computer virus. They, you know, so it didn't want to overstate that problem, but it, it is a real concern, with, especially with the internet and with the diffusion of technology across the world. It often can be hard to regulate. And it's also being used uh, in Israel, but also I know in China, right? right. And for a variety of different kind of crowd control uh, and disciplining contexts. So, I'm always a little bit careful with China because China is the sort of the boogeyman that allows us to feel better about ourselves sometimes. Like, well, we're not China, so we, like, don't don't hold just don't make China the example of yeah. what you're you know you're I not. Agree. Um, but yes, China is a really good example of how you can use this technology. They are using it to to uh, um, to identify racial minorities. They're using it in many cases to put those racial minorities in in you know in concentration camps or at least separating them that from the general population. Um, these are incredibly coercive uses of the technology. Uh, China is becoming famous for its so social credit scoring system where we're starting this, you know, I think it's, it's, not, it's not yet as pervasive as it may be someday, but we're, it's being used essentially to identify you and make decisions about whether you should, for ex whether you're a good person and you should be allowed, for example, to take a long distance train you know, whether you should be able to qualify for a particular financial tools. And so, again, tools for social control. If I can identify you, I know where you are, and I can make a decision about whether you should be allowed to travel, where you should be allowed to go. And this, is, again, is, is part of, as you, you know, called it, a socio-technical sort of, you know, system that allows you to sort of use technology to achieve other ends. And at least perhaps a warning for yeah. us, right? As you yeah, say. no, it is, it is a cautionary tale, but we, we have our own, we have our yeah. own ways that we use this technology. Right. You don't have to, <laughs> you know, don't, don't think that just because we're, we're not quite as bad as China that we, we are not deploying this. We cannot be better in how we deploy these technologies. Right. right. Maybe we'll start by um, asking some questions from the audience. Um, do citizens have any recourse when facial recognition technology is used without their permission? Um, if you're in Illinois, you do. <laughs> no, I mean, in Illinois, it's a very strong law. You actually, it has a private right of action. You can actually sue someone for, for taking your face print without your permission. Um, and it's the basis for a number of lawsuits against big tech companies for doing sort of exactly this kind of thing. Um, I believe the technology is also illegal in Texas. There is not a private right of action, though, so you hear less about it. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other. I mean, the honest answer is, is probably no, um, in most of the country. But you know, you you could, if you were, you know, if we were feeling kind of crazy, there are federal agencies that arguably could reach this. The Federal Trade Commission has unfair and deceptive. Trade practices authority. So if they decide, you know, taking a face print is unfair. They could potentially reach into that. It's not something they've pursued before, though, and it would be a stretch from their current jurisprudence. Another audience member asked, "What led to the Illinois rule of consent, and what is the roadmap for getting new rules in?" Well, it's interesting because in many ways, Illinois happened really early in this debate. Like, uh, the Illinois law is not a new one. It's, a, it's at least seven or eight years old. So uh, in a lot of cases, I think what happened was the Illinois legislature was sort of prescient in getting ahead of this technology before there were tech companies lobbying against it, before it became embedded. And they just sort of, they said, you can't do this. And, and for a long time, the only people who were really that upset, I think, were like gyms, because you couldn't you know, take people's fingerprint at the gym right, without getting a going through more of a process. And, and so that, in some ways, is, is a way that we've had some success with regulating new technologies is to sort of get at them be, before they become really entrenched. Um, we're kind of past that now, but we're also seeing 
as we see a broader push on commercial privacy, we're seeing a real focus on face recognition. People are particularly concerned about the deployment of face recognition. We're seeing it in the debate over privacy legislation in Washington State. It's come up a number of times in California, both at the municipal level and at the state level. Um, I think some of the other sort of state privacy laws that have been proposed include face recognition bans. So I guess I would say that it's, it's something that is ripe to be regulated, certainly at the state level. And you've seen some federal, we had saw a federal bill that was fairly limited, but did have some, some limits on how you could use face recognition that was bipartisan and it was introduced by Senators Coons and Lee earlier this week. So there is there's sort of interest across the board. And I would say right now, the state is the most sort of fertile, the state level is the most yeah. fertile place. Beyond policy advocacy, what actions can individuals take in order to slow the growth or subvert the use of this technology by companies or the government? Um, so this is, so there's, it's interesting, right? I mean, there are things you can do, right? You could actually put extensive makeup on your face to distort the print image. Like there are things you, the sort of privacy self-help kind of things you could do. Um, by and large as a society, we, we don't, we tend to like look askance at somebody who covers their face. That's a, a thing that is maybe we aren't comfortable with, but maybe we could be comfortable with it. I mean, this is certainly an environment. I mean, you're in an academic setting. You're in a place where you could be a little different without being, you know, without sort of suffering. Like if I tried to pay, check, put checks on my face and go to work tomorrow, well, I'm the boss actually, so I can just do that. <laughs> but if I wasn't the boss, people might like not, might look askance at me for doing that. But here you could probably do it. And if somebody said, gosh, why does your face look like that? Maybe you could explain like, because we, we have face recognition in, deployed in our cities and that's wrong and this is this is my response and maybe that's sort of a little bit of citizen activism that can help us um, kind of push the issue forward but there you know you you, sh you can I mean you can try to stay out of the broader databases that um, that fuel face recognition so if you don't feel comfortable having a Facebook profile a LinkedIn profile anything that links a good high quality photo of you to your real identity is one that's going to make face recognition much easier. Um, obviously, it's harder to do if uh, you can't stay out of the DMV database, and that's a, you know, and that's one that police are pulling from. So that, that that's harder to escape. What are the ethical and technical implications of the increased use of facial recognition for intelligence and military targeting purposes? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, I mean, there are a lot of, they're very similar to the, the ones we've laid out. The stakes are just higher. I mean, we're identifying people for the purposes of potentially targeting them for, you know, for an attack. And we've seen, we've obviously seen drone strikes for the last at least seven or eight years. You know, you can imagine a face recognition enabled drone strike being particularly problematic, not just because drone strikes are really problematic. I and mean, that goes back to the whole argument about unfair systems and then layering on face recognition on top of it. Um, you know, you have greater potential for error, but to be fair, and I'm, I'm loath to be fair here because I think drone strikes are, are just unjust for so many reasons. You could argue that that actually, in, in fact, makes it, more, makes it more likely that I'm not gonna target the wrong person, that in fact, it's another safeguard that you can put in place that is as charitable as I can be to drone strikes. Now, this, this audience member wants to know, what, what can we do when biometrics fail? So for example, your facial measurements change as you age. So what are the implications of facial recognition, um, how, their validity and reliance over time? Um, so uh, they, there's a big impact uh, certainly for children as you grow up your face your face print changes substantially um, the prints have become more stable as you grow older as an adult there is an impact but um, if you have enough images and you you know you're you have a robust enough template the aging process has been shown to sort of have less of a 
an impact on accuracy, but that has a lot to do with how many photos you're using to sort of create that initial template that you're working from. There's also an issue with transgender people, right? I mean, oh, I'm in, sure, yeah. My, I, I was just, I haven't read it in detail, but I was just seeing today that, you know, sort of there are many DMVs that force mm -hmm. a transgender person to, um, you know, wipe off their makeup and, right. um, you know, sort of appear as their biological, the given biology at birth gender, and then, right. you know, and that's used for facial recognition. And then it has, again, the kind of, I mean, I think what's one of the things that's interesting to me about what you've said is that is actually, yes, it's it has very difficult um, implications in terms of cr criminal justice, but these kinds of um, quieter, perhaps at the mm -hmm. outset, you know, in the process of data collection, the kinds of, you know, social disciplining that's happening yeah. is super interesting. Well, that is... And distressing, I mean, well, disturbing. <laughs> well, we, we're allowed to get... We, we get we're <laughs> interested in technology. That's part of why you get into this sort of thing. It is, and I mean, yeah, I mean, technology is often a multiplier in a lot of ways. It can multiply benefits in society and it can multiply harms. I mean, that's, that's true of many tools. Right, and technology is, is a tool. So, yes, I mean, there's no question that as you, as you kind of go throughout these systems, as you see them deployed more broadly, you're going to see these kind of impacts in all kinds of unexpected ways. What kind of regulation should be put into place to protect data collected by big companies such as Apple? So that's a really, we haven't talked at all about data protection, yeah. but it is worth understanding that this is personal information same way your social security number is personal information, you should there you should expect good cybersecurity protections for it. That information, you should have the ability to delete that information if you access and find out what is you know how that information is being held and deleted if you want. And that would be a right you would have if you were in the EU, for example. You'd have those, those rights. We do not have them in the United States by and large, except in California once the new California Privacy Protection Act goes into effect in January. Um, but you should also, Apple does some interesting things that are illustrative of this. So Apple doesn't actually take the biometric off the device. What they do is they store it in a separate place, in a, in a separate place on the device that's actually physically separated from the rest of the systems in the phone to make it even harder to get access to. So when you have, take a face print through a, you know, face ID or previously through a fingerprint, it resides on a physically separate place on your phone. And that's a really good privacy protection, right? It makes it much harder to get at that, that biometric, makes it much harder to, you know, if a hacker wants to, to get access to, this, to, to your information, it makes it much harder to do, which is, illustrative of a broader concept that we should all embrace, embrace, which is this idea of privacy by design. We can build some of these systems at the outset so they are more privacy protective. We don't have to wait till after we see the harms and then try to backfill the protections in place. Why don't we try to anticipate some of these problems at the outset and build systems that mitigate those problems at the beginning? How can the government even subject a technology like facial recognition to a moratorium when private companies are already using it? That's a very good question, and that varies a lot depending on where, sort of, who's doing the regulating. It's like, for example, the city of San Francisco cannot tell Amazon, they, can't, they cannot regulate the use of recognition in San Francisco. They can regulate how the city of San Francisco chooses to deploy the technology, but they just don't have the authority. But a state could impose a moratorium. They could, they could require any face recognition be either banned, they could say that face recognition requires consent, they could say, we're gonna have a moratorium while we think about rules. And they, they have that authority, and because there's no overriding federal law, that, that power devolves to the state. The state could actually do that. And similarly, the federal government could do the same thing. Would the increased accuracy of face recognition just lead to better surveillance of a group that's already disproportionately targeted by the criminal justice system? Yeah, it could. I mean, I think that's certainly what we'd worry about. Um, arguably, and this is not, and this is not a face recognition example, but so we are using 
we're starting to see artificial intelligence deployed to do things like pre-trial bail determinations, right? So when I go to decide whether I get released on bail or whether I have to stay in, in the criminal, there, there are, there are off-the-shelf technologies, uh, Compass is one of them, that will say sort of red, yellow, green. And nominally, they're not making a, a determination, but they're, they're making a judgment. They're saying red is definitely not, yellow is maybe, green is, is you should. And judges, by and large, are following those determinations very closely. And there's, there, I won't get into the details, but there are real concerns about the racial bias and how those assessments are made, the training data that's used, and the way that they're weighted. But the current system for doing bail determinations is really bad, too. <laughs> like, judges aren't, don't turn, actually turn out to be real good at this either, and they tend to rely on their own set of biases. So it's not that automating this process is automatically bad. The trick is that you have to automate it in a way that's fair. And that's a harder, and that requires more understanding from policymakers about how the technology works, and it requires more deliberation about how these systems are built. How often are facial recognition databases wiped? So if I'm in one, am I in it for life? That would really depend on who created the database. Um, in, in, some, in a lot of countries, like in Western democracies, there may be data retention limits, so that any kind of personal information, the expectation is that you're going to delete it after a set period of time, or after you, know, you haven't used the service for a set period of time, but that's going to to vary widely depending on the jurisdiction and who holds the data. Is there a way to encourage tech companies to innovate and develop, thinking about con consent from the start rather than just retroactively putting in place after they've been caught? Well, there are a lot of ways. <laughs> um, some of them are more effective than others. Uh, I mean, tech companies are, are, I think, becoming more sensitive to these questions, right? I mean, this te the tech backlash that we've seen the last couple of years is real. Like, people are really worried about these technologies, and companies are really worried about people being worried about these technologies. They want them to use them. So I think it's a, we're seeing a lot of different ways to put the pressure on. We're seeing it in state and federal laws. We're also seeing it in putting, you know, individual employees of those companies putting pressure on their companies to, to behave in a more responsible way. I mean, Silicon Valley's most precious resources are its engineering talent. And if the engineers aren't happy, then that can make real change at a company. And so saying, like, we want to deploy these technologies in a more responsible way, we, the employees of, of a big tech company, it, it really is a way to make a meaningful change. Um, and, and there's a whole bunch. I mean, there's just a lot of ways. That the, the, I think we're in a little bit of a moment where people are paying attention to this technology, and that gives us a lot of opportunity to try to push changes across the board. Is consent the right way to think about it? Uh, I mean, I think in the U.S., the, an individualistic society like mm -hmm. ours, consent, individual consent, is a, a, seems like the straightforward way to think about it. But this is a technology that implicates families and communities, just like I mean, I'm, I'm oh, it thinking about 100%, yeah. yeah, I'm thinking about you know forensic DNA databases as an analog, right. for example, and 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 in those conversations around DNA databases and biobanks. There's been a lot of discussion about how um, consent is an, is an inadequate mm -hmm. way of thinking about this. So right. I'm wondering, are there alternative ways so of thinking about this? I, I, I do think consent is, so I am not a big fan of consent as a solution to privacy problems. I think we all understand that like checking that little box and saying, I agree to your terms of service, Congratulations, you've consented. I don't think anybody feels like their rights have been protected by that process, right? That's just not a that that's not not working for us. And and so one of the things that we've really been pushing is this idea that we need to put some of the responsibility back on the data holder as opposed to the, the sort of person who's consenting. But I do think that we can do that in a way that is is very cl is closely analogous to what we think of as true consent. So if to give you an example. When I use my iPhone, actually, I, I use an Android phone because I'm a fuddy-duddy, but um, my kids are always like, why do you use a phone? <laughs> but I don't have Face ID. But if I had Face ID and I did it, I understand what's happening there, right? I understand that I am giving you my face template in exchange for the ability to open my phone. That's a pretty close to the pure idea that we have of consent, right? I get it. I know what the trade-off is here. 
So the trick, I believe, is to stop there and say, congratulations, you got consent to collect that face template for the purpose of allowing somebody to open their phone. You don't get to do anything else with it. That's it. We're going to stop and we're going to make that a hard use limitation. And if we do that, then I feel like we've gotten, the, you are responsible as the data holder to hold that line. You understand what the, the benefit was. You don't get to use it for anything else. But we really do honor the individual's desire to either sort of have more or less use of this kind of technology. And so I do think that there's a role for consent. It's just that it can't be like a get out of jail free card mm -hmm. that says, once I've gotten consent, that's it. I'm, you know, I'm good. I can do whatever I want. Is transparency the right way to be thinking about this issue, considering that transparency could mean opening up all data for everybody? Or do we need new definitions and values as we frame this issue? Transparency is, is, a, is interesting in this, in this area because transparency doesn't work super well for what we're talking about, right? The fact, the fact of the matter is if I put a sign up that says, face recognition at use in this facility, but if I need to go use that facility or I want to shop in that store, that transparency is worthless to me. That's not a that's not a useful technology, or it's not a useful sort of uh, benefit to me. Um, I do think that transparency can be useful in the kind of way that we described it before, like understanding as part of a broader system how the system is being used, how many searches are being run, who might be run against a face recognition database, like that kind of transparency. How accurate is the system? Like I do think that there are ways that we can use transparency to, to really try to drive uh, fairness in the system. But transparency itself is, is, not a, is probably not an optimum tool in this case for a lot of reasons. It's, it's hard to escape the technology and it's also hard to know as a user like how this technology is being deployed. So having a, being transparent about the fact that you're deploying it doesn't maybe help me understand what's actually happening. We've heard a lot about policies about the use of facial recognition technology. Are policies about the technology itself relevant? For example, last week news reports reported cameras being marketed in China with built-in minority detection. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's, I think regulating the technology itself is really, is really important. I mean, we are seeing more and more cameras with internet connected you know, we're seeing more nets of cameras, right, where that are internet connected and then can be, have a variety of add-ons. And so regulating like when we're actually using the technology is really important. Here's a great example. We're, activists for many years have been very excited about using, about police body cameras. This idea that we can use a body camera and we can really see what happened um, at, a, at a crime scene or, you know, while a confrontation happened with the police. As they become more widely deployed, we've sort of started to re grapple with the real limitations of this technology. Police turn them off. Oftentimes they're not pointed in the right direction. Or police will be allowed to look at the camera footage before they write their report and will sort of write a report that matches whatever happened in the camera footage no matter what you know, and, and the, you know, allows them to kind of curate that. Well, now, say, imagine we just said, well, I'm Taser, which is a company that deploys, makes many of these body cameras. I'm gonna put automatic face recognition on all of the body cameras. It's great, new technologies that are gonna help everyone. So now what you've done is you've taken a tool that was supposed to be a tool for social justice, that was supposed to protect people and their interactions with police, and you've turned it into a surveillance tool. You said, now I get to identify everybody as I walk down the street and I'm a police officer, I get to identify all the people on my patrol. I potentially get to put them in a database and track where they are. I get to you know, know who everybody is and you know, rely on that identification in ways that may be problematic. So now we've actually flipped the presumption. It's gone from being something that's supposed to benefit those communities to something that may actually harm them. So yeah, we gotta think about when we're deploying these technologies, what the context is going to be used in and who, who's actually going to benefit from it. So I want to wrap up with one last uh, question. Yeah. So we're in a public policy school uh, and 
uh, a lot of the folks who are getting master's degrees or undergraduate degrees here will go off into policy or law. They'll be in a position of having to... Someday I'll um, work for you someday. That's, that's well, I'm yeah. <laughs> well, or perhaps, yeah. maybe. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, this conversation in some ways, our conversation hasn't been too technical, but it is right. a technical issue and people often might say, oh, that's really technical, I don't under, I, I don't, I mm. sort of black box it and say, okay, I can't, right. I can't deal with it. And yet it, it's incredibly consequential as we've been discussing. So for, for students who are interested in this or who are even just generally, you know, pursuing policy careers, which are, you know, given the size of this issue, they're likely, it's likely to intersect with their lives. What kinds of, what kinds of training, what kinds of classes, expertise do you think is, is useful in, um, being able to navigate the kind of these issues, these technical issues. I mean, in your own career, you, you've come from law and you've yeah. had to uh, had to navigate pretty technical um, questions. So I'm wondering how you think about this. So I, I mean, I guess I, I would say I'm, I was sort of and purposefully not making this a too technical conversation because I don't think it needs to be. Yeah. You can all understand the concepts I'm talking about. We don't need to get too deeply into the weeds of the technology to understand the policy implications of it. Um, I think that you do have to be willing to ask hard questions and be willing to explore like, under the hood and be really skeptical about claims about the efficacy of technology. Technology is often treated by policymakers like it's some sort of magic fairy dust that you can just sprinkle on problems and make them all be fixed because technology solves it, and it very rarely does, right? And so anytime someone comes in and says to you, oh, I've got this tech, I've got this silver bullet that's going to solve it all, right there your antenna should go up and say, I'm, I'm going to be sold a bill of goods here. So you have to ask hard questions, and then I think you have to go to your own sets of validators and say, you know, I'm not a technical person, but certainly your local university has a sort of neutral person who can tell you um, whether some, whether claims that are being made are, are real. You know, a lot of Congress has been pushing in recent years to add more technology policy fellows mm -hmm. so there are more people with a background in technology policy. So you don't have to be a technical expert. You just have to be willing to not accept any sort of claim that you're being offered as, you know, unvarnished truth without probing pretty deeply into it and without looking for sort of outside experts to help you kind of sort through the the fact and the fiction. And if you do that, um, literally, if you just kind of get to the point where you separate out the stuff that doesn't work from the stuff that works, you will be miles ahead of many policy discussions because you'll at least be having a factual discussion about what technology can do as opposed to sort of a wishful discussion about what we'd love it to do in, in a, an imaginary society. Great. Well, I certainly endorse that yeah, position as well. Anyway, well, thank you very much. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank so much.